Be sure to check out MythVisionPodcast.com. Help MythVision grow, guys. Become a Patreon member. You guys will get early access to all my videos when I'm done editing them. Also, it's a small community where you guys can message me your questions and talk to me in private. You guys can also donate through PayPal and Cash App. Join the social media links down in the description. We have Twitter, Facebook, all sorts of social media. Help the community of MythVision grow. Hit the subscribe button, hit that bell so you guys are notified every time I do a live video and you don't miss any of my content. We are myth vision welcome back to myth vision podcast derek lambert ladies and gentlemen have you ever took the time to check out that show leah remini has the aftermath of scientology and all that cultish mentality that she describes as she's escaping the cult how it like shaped and formed her every thought it controlled her I know from personal experience what that was like as a fundamentalist Christian coming from non-denominational Christianity, speaking in tongues, gibberish, thinking the end was about to happen, all those crazy ideas. And then I progressively found my way into Calvary Chapel, and then I became a Calvinist and a Presbyterian in the PCA. Well, this show ain't about me. This show is about Lloyd Evans. And today, Lloyd Evans is the number one speaker, ex-Jehovah's Witness in the world right now. There's not a single person who who has such a vocal, uh, uh, if you will, influence on the Internet right now that I'm aware of that is speaking out against the cult that had him in shackles, his mind, at least. And so with that being said, Lloyd, thank you for joining me today, brother. Thank you for that extremely flattering introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'll give you the address where you can mail the check and um, <laughs> we will be fine. <laughs> no, but seriously, I was watching Leah Remney's show. And then this episode takes a turn a little, and it sounded just a little different than Scientology, but the same crap. And I went, and then you were the main guy on there, and I suspect you, in terms of the depth of the theology and such, you go deep. And we're going to get into some ideas, I suspect, on the show today. And if anyone is watching this, you like this stuff, go down in the description. He has a book. I called it a bestseller, even though it's not uh, in terms of uh, numbers. The Reluctant Apostate. Lloyd Evans. Guys, get the book. It's solid. It goes through a thorough analysis on the Jehovah's Witnesses and, of course, him leaving the cult. Why? Why do you leave? And what happens? What's happening now? And so I don't know where to begin, Lloyd, to be honest with you. I don't even know where to start. In the beginning, there was a conversation. Um, yeah, well, look, it was a, th a thrill to do the show. Um, I'm glad that you w found it compelling and you could relate to it. And sounds like with your fundamentalist background, there were reasons for you to relate to it. But yeah, I definitely would agree that when it comes to cults, uh, they can have completely different teachings and completely different theologies. Uh, but strip away all of that uh, surface stuff and you have the same machinery of manipulation running away underneath. So that's the way I tend to think of it. Um, Scientology may be a completely different organization in terms of the beliefs that it pushes and the way it's structured. Um, but it, it, in many ways, it's the same and it uses the exact same methods to manipulate people and in many ways dehumanize them, make them do things that they wouldn't ordinarily want to do as as rational uh, beings. Yeah, that's what it seems. Uh, it came across really clear in your episode, a lot of heartache, families divorcing from their own families because of a belief system that teaches them to do these things. And of course, I suspect that they, uh, they have a, a I guess you'd say apologetics against that, or do they openly say, no, we never, we never tell them that they're supposed to never talk to their family. Do they say that? They kind of beat around the bush and they have a JW.org website with its own Q and a section where they try and do their best to put their own spin on things with the shunning. What they say is, Oh well, there's lots of situations in which you don't, you, in which you can leave and you won't get shunned, and then they they spend time laboring on the very small number of loopholes in which you won't get shunned. For example, um, a husband won't be expected to shun his disfellowshipped wife, and um, parents won't be expected to shun their 14, 15 year old son or daughter who's living with them. So these are a small number of loopholes, and they say, well, because this is the case, then that means that we that we don't do shunning. And they basically ignore all of the other areas in which, for example, if you're an 18, 19, 20 year old, 
you're going to get kicked out and your parents aren't, aren't going to speak to you. Um, so, yeah, they do their best. But for the most part, uh, when it comes to apostates, they try to stick their head in the sand and pretend we're not there and <laughs> just hope that their followers won't do any digging. And for the most part, they can bank on their followers not doing any digging because they've got such a tight control of their minds. Mm. You're an activist who out, out is outspoken uh, right now, constantly dealing with these uh, these these people uh, from the Jehovah's Witness leadership that are always putting out a new video. I see. I just recently subscribed to you since the show, and I said, "Okay, wow, uh, <laughs> these guys know you real well. I suspect they have council meetings sitting around thinking about Lloyd Evans all day." <laughs> I don't think it's quite like that, but. Put it this way, when I first started doing this, I wasn't I never dreamed that I would get letters from them or that my name would be mentioned in letters written by my former religion, or that my former religion would try to accuse me of hate speech for for criticizing them. I never imagined it would get to that point, and that's where we are at the moment. Um, because I'm a core participant for an investigation in England and Wales into child sexual abuse among Jehovah's Witnesses. I've been doing this for months and I've been submitting pages and pages and pages of evidence to this inquiry. And I found out just a few weeks back that back in February, just before the coronavirus hit, um, my former religion wrote to the inquiry and said, we think you should get rid of this guy because he's, um, how did they put it? A hate speech enthusiast. And here's a nine page dossier with 30 something examples of him saying things about us on his YouTube channel that we don't like. So you can imagine as a YouTuber, I'm like, I need to see this dossier. So we, we had to go through like a legal process to, to get it cleared so that I could speak about it on my channel. So now I'm just making a series of YouTube videos showing about all the blatant ways in which they've misrepresented my words in this dossier. So I it's backfired, that. basically, yeah. I saw that recently, actually. You were showing exactly what was said and what they said, and they mm. manipulated few words, which changed mm. the context completely. Um, let's start Let's start at the beginning. So were mm. you born into this? I mean, I know you probably have given this story quite often, so I don't want to spend too much time repeating the same stuff we've heard mm. before, if we can. I want to move into some of the doctrines and crazy teachings and ideas that you found uh, out there, but... Uh, you were born into this. Were you someone moving up in leadership? Were you serious as a Jehovah's Witness? And all of a sudden, what can you recall the thing or things that made you wake up, if you will? I was born into it. Uh, both my parents took it extremely seriously. Uh, I felt as though I needed to kind of make the truth my own is how they put it and forge a career in in the organization. So yeah, I was a ministerial servant from the age of 19, which is like a stepping stone to being an elder. Um, I started pioneering around the same time. Pioneering is where you devote 70 hours per month to doing the preaching work. Uh, around about that time, I started having doubts, but I buried my doubts when my mother died because I felt as though the only way I, I could see her again would be if I... Uh, stayed as close as possible to the center of the organization and didn't allow any doubts to distract me. So I did what they uh, suggest in the Book of Mormon musical. They have a song where they sing, Turn It Off, uh, which applies equally to uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, the way they deal with doubts. So I just kind of forged ahead. Um, I graduated from the ministerial training school in 2005, which was like uh, an elite class for, for men in the organization. Um, in 2008, I was appointed an elder. Uh, 2009, I stood down and moved to Croatia. Um, and it was moving to Croatia that caused me to wake up because um, I suddenly found myself in a strange country where they didn't speak my language. And although I resolved that I would learn the language and I would maybe go back to being an elder at some point, um, all it took was a few months for just that disconnect from the indoctrination to make me think hang on what were those doubts that i had when i was 19 or 20 and start revisiting them and then the more i revisited them the more i thought you know what this i'm just not a jehovah's witness because to be a jehovah's witness you have to believe everything right and so if i was able to say write down a list on paper 
of say nine things, which I did, nine things that I didn't agree with, then by definition, I wasn't a Jehovah's Witness. I was fooling myself and I was fooling everyone else. So thus began quite a painful process of extricating myself from the organization, which I deal with in my book. But that's basically how I came to be in this situation. Wow. I know for a fact that they say that's Satan. You know, they, they do the whole mind manipulation. Like if you're doubting, you know, it's the enemy it, that it's like. And then there that's like, dude, it's such a psychological prison. It's this big insulation of like they imprison you that when you're away, you're still you're still trapped in the mindset. So um, I, I'd love to know. And I want to ask a few questions because I asked this of uh, fifth. We call him fifth Cliff Henderson. Oh, yeah, yeah. In our last interview. And I said, OK, while you were pioneering, which is him pretty much marketing the organization door to door, um, did you bump into anybody who knew their stuff? And you said, oh, crap. And yeah. did it ever cause you to like add up some planted seeds in the back of your head? Like, whoa, I really need to look into that more. Yeah. And I'm not proud of how I dealt with it. Um, I, I remember calling on someone who was a writer and I said, what books have you written? And he said, the books that I've written, you will never read because they're university books, they're, they're textbooks. And he was um, a student of, uh, I don't think this was the field that he wrote in, but he was uh, very excited about evolution. And, and so I called on him frequently and he would show me examples in the Jehovah's Witness propaganda about evolution where they had misquoted. Because this is what they do with evolution. Same thing that they did with me with the hate speech. They cherry pick where scientists say something that might suggest evolution's wrong. And, you know, denuded of context, you know, they, they put it in their books and then Jehovah's Witnesses think, oh, they're quoting from scientists here. And so this guy was starting to show me these things. And I also remember him showing me some stuff about the Bible, about the authenticity of the Bible. He showed me, um, I don't know whether you're familiar with the the story of the virgin birth and how that was all based on a mistranslation of the Hebrew word Alma, which means young woman of marriageable age, yeah. of childbearing age, sorry, which the writers of the Septuagint mistranslated into virgin. And of course, when, when they were writing the book of Matthew, they based it on the Septuagint, saw the word virgin and thought, oh, now we've got to make Jesus born of a virgin. Okay, we'll come up with this far-fetched story of how all that happened. So anyway, he basically told me that as a Jehovah's Witness, and it did kind of set cogs going. Um, but I can just remember sitting down with him once, and I think I read him some verse where I think it was Jesus saying something along the lines of, God has hidden his truth from, from the wise and intellectual ones and given it to people babes. who aren't wise and, in, yeah, babes <laughs> and that kind of thing. I think... And, and I look back and I think, what an incredibly arrogant thing to do. So what you're saying is, this is wisdom. This is intellectual stuff that you're showing me. I prefer the ignorance, is essentially what, what that verse is saying. So I'm not proud of how I dealt with it. But I do think often, um, you know, I don't know whether he's still alive, but at some point, maybe if I'm driving down that road, I'll, I'll swing by and see if he's still there and just say, look, I woke up eventually and what you said did actually stick, you know? Be cool, pull the camera out too, just so people know, like, this is a real guy that I bumped into. What was that like dealing with me? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, that's actually interesting because it makes me think of the whole Christ's crucifixion and resurrection as foolishness to the world, you know? Uh, which is crazy. They, they That whole system of thought uh, develops these ideas. So, while you were out there, did you convert many people to the faith? I'm very proud to say I didn't. I did uh, study, they call it studying. Really what it means is going through a book where you have to answer everything according to what's written in the book. They literally have paragraph question, paragraph question, paragraph question. And the question basically asks you to repeat what's in the paragraph. So it's not like a bad thing if you just quote verbatim what's in the paragraph. At least you're answering the question. Uh, so I had one of these studies with uh, a young guy whose parents were Jehovah's Witnesses. And my elders asked me to study with him and 
as a result of us studying together, he got baptized, but it's not like I met him in the door to door work. So I kind of forgive myself for that one. You know? Yeah. I think fifth had the same experience he said. Mm. Uh, and it was like, usually you guys are either door shut on you or they're just nice and they're being nice to you, but they really aren't going to become what you are. Um, (laughs) I did have people being nice to me, by the way. And I did have, there were a lot of doors shut on me and I'm sure on cliff as well. Um, but there were also people who who would speak to us and who invited us in, and and even situations where we thought, I'm in with a chance here. This person sounds really interested in what I have to say. Um, surely it's only a matter of time until they're studying and they become a witness. And then maybe two or three visits later, they're like, uh, oh, Lloyd, um, I'd appreciate it if you don't come anymore. Just do a total U-turn out of the blue. And at the time, you'd be scratching your head thinking, oh, what what did I say? What what did I do wrong? And of course, now with hindsight, you think, well, they looked on Google. You know, that that's kind of all you need to do yeah. is just go on Google and all the information's there. So yeah. Wow. Are your family your family's still in the organization or have they left? Uh it depends what you mean by family. Right. <laughs> Most of my relatives are still Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, my, I count my family as just me, my wife, and my two girls, to be honest. Um, and we have in-laws, funnily enough, who are Jehovah's Witnesses who live in this building. And it's a bit complicated, but they've managed to come up with a reason why they well, why they won't shun us. And what that means is that they're not, quote-unquote, exemplary. So he couldn't be an elder or a servant, for example. They probably shun them. Yeah. Well, yeah, and and to a degree, they are they are already shunning um, my my in laws. Some of them view them as bad association and won't speak to them because they're speaking to us and because I'm an apostate and and we're disassociated. Uh, but yeah, my the family I, I'm no longer have any involvement with the family I grew up with. Um, obviously, my mother died. My sister's shunning me. Uh, my dad shunning me. My dad is an elder. And he hasn't met either of my two children. He he wow. hasn't met his two grandchildren. So that just shows. I mean, I mean, I was saying to begin with how cults make people bypass their humanity. Now that I'm a father, there's no way in the world you could tell me, oh, don't speak to your child because they think no. differently to you. There's no way anyone could say that. And and same about my grandchildren, if if I have any, if I'm lucky enough to to see any grandchildren. But yeah, it's 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 crazy. But it's just one of those things where the more years go by, the more you just get used to it, you know. Yeah, and then I know that you have no emotional effect from this at this point. I'm sure there's a psychological damage there, though. But either way, I, I I'm sorry, you know, I'm sorry for you because you know that. Uh, that's uh, an important part of all of our lives to have family there. So I didn't want to make this an emotional show, of course. No, no, but- no, it's fine. I'm, it's, it's been a number of years now, so I've had yeah. lots of times to get my head around it, you know? Yeah. 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 I mean, being one who has parents, you know, who might believe my mom definitely does. My dad, it's hard to pin him down where he's at, but uh, they wouldn't shun me ever, you know? And that's, mm. that's the, le- that's, that's sad. This organization mm. is doing that. So, Lloyd, if you don't mind, because I am the ignorant one, okay, when it comes to understanding this cult, understanding its teachings, I heard little here, little there. I know some things from people who've come to my door or looking online a little bit, and I kind of want to still man the organization. I don't want to straw man them, but I would like for you to take me into some absurd things, some things that are red flags, like straight up. Now that you've left the cult, looking back, you're like, whoa, okay. Are there some things you could discuss for our audience who's like me, who may know some things? Some of them might even be extra of his witness. I get a lot of comments of people who follow me. I'm a skeptic uh, who was a fundamentalist Christian. I'm no longer a believer in that. Uh, I believe in humanity. I believe in good things uh, that are applicable uh, to any of us here in the United States, at least. I don't know in the Middle East if that applies, but uh, yeah, tell me some things about this organization, some of their beliefs, and we can go into that. I know there's court situations going on right now in Australia. Some big things are happening, but some of their beliefs, they take Mm. certain things to bank, but they disregard other texts. They pick and choose what they like, you know. Basically, yeah. Well, what can I say? Uh, They... Hard to summarize it all, but they're a non-Trinitarian Christian group. So like the Mormons don't think Jesus is God, 
um, uh, neither do Jehovah's Witnesses. So they think God and Jesus, uh, Yahweh and Jesus, are two different entities. Um, so that puts them at odds immediately with main, lots of mainstream Christians who who say, oh, well, some of them kind of say, oh, well, you were never a Christian, Lloyd, if you didn't believe that Jesus was God, which irritates me because I think, no, I was a follower of Jesus. Just because I didn't think he was God didn't mean I wasn't a follower of Jesus. So, yeah, they, they're they a fundamentalist, literalist, uh, creationist group. They're not young earth creationists. They don't think the whole earth was created 6,000 years ago, but they do uh, believe or have indicated in the past that the history of of the planet can be measured in thousands of years rather than millions or billions of years. Um, they believe in the creative days. They believe that Adam was created 6,000 years ago. Um, they believe that Christianity, basically 144,000 uh, followers of Christ who have ever lived going back to the time of Jesus will be the ones who go to heaven and that includes people who are living now, most notably the governing body. They get to be among this exclusive group. They of haven't 100... met that hundred and forty-four thousand like a long time ago. I don't get <laughs> no. it. You would think that in the in the whole history of Christianity, there would be more than one hundred and forty-four thousand who get to go to heaven. But apparently, it's just that number. Um, and they include <laughs> the current governing body, the eight dudes who who lead the whole thing. Um, everyone else. Uh, can look forward to living on a quote-unquote paradise earth. I don't think it's much of a paradise because it's built on the ruins of genocide. So yeah. the Armageddon that Jehovah's Witnesses look forward to is a global catastrophe that will literally destroy everybody who's not one of Jehovah's Witnesses. So we're talking you know, nearly 8 billion men, women, children, all being slaughtered for the quote unquote crime of not being Jehovah's Witnesses. So, you know, and you don't really think about it in those terms when you're a Jehovah's Witness, or you try to think about it as little as possible. But that's essentially when a Jehovah's Witness speaks to you or calls at your door, they are they are there to try and save you. They believe that they would be blood guilty if they didn't try to warn you of this coming calamity. Uh, and if you died because they hadn't exerted the effort to try and warn you, they would be guilty themselves and worthy of destruction themselves if they didn't try to warn you. So that's why they so enthusiastically call at people's doors, because it's kind of on them if you don't become a Jehovah's Witness and it's in their power to to change that, you know, so. Wow. Wow. It's Did messed they, up. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say psychologically, that type of eschatological approach, which most Christians believe anyway, you know, like mm. if you're not a believer, you're not going to get raptured. You're going to be stuck here. And the Holy Spirit leaves the earth too. a lot of fundamentalists left behinders. You know, the Holy Spirit goes when the rapture happens. So you can't access salvation. You're going to deal with the punishments here. There's various forms of eschatological positions that come to these crazy conclusions. And why, why this almost sounds like a weapon of warfare mentality. It's, it's almost like, and I, I'm a big freedom of speech person. Okay. I believe in the freedom of religion, freedom of speech and all that. But when your religion is this adamant about dividing humanity based on what you believe, I, I don't know how that doesn't disturb some laws that we have, like creating those issues. You know, how does humanity become, how do we get along and yet allow systems like this that are just as bad as saying there's in America, especially in the 18, 19, early 1900s, black bathrooms and white bathrooms. It's almost segregation in the mind. Mm. And it, it's, it, I don't know, it's tough to explain. Well, and one of the, the real problems, of course, of this kind of thinking, I mean, there's a difference between thinking that you won't get raptured or thinking that you're not going to go to heaven when you die, which is kind of the worst case scenario for lots of Christians or, or thinking that you're going to go to hell. All of these things have kind of fairly obscure concepts uh, that don't really involve anything in the here and now, whereas Armageddon, the teaching of Armageddon says everything outside, everything outside of our organiza organization deserves to be destroyed. So not just you know nearly 8 billion people, but all of the governments, all of the institutions, the police, the fire department, the hospitals, everything, everything needs to be reduced to rubble and you can imagine what that sort of mentality gives you 
when we deal with things like child sex abuse, mm. which requires a, some level of trust in, in quote unquote, the secular authorities. You need to have some degree of trust in, in the police to intervene and and you need to give them some kind of authority to intervene so this very insular very doomsday uh, attitude that the witnesses have expresses itself in their reluctance to involve the authorities when it comes to abuse wow it's like scientology all over again an insulated bubble and man just kind of watching that show and listening to her explain that when she finally had the panel of people and was explaining the Scientology, the sex scandals and stuff that were going on and listening to the, the retired FBI agent, the, the like, there's a lady who's an expert in cults. They, and they're explaining like, it's almost too difficult because we're not educated. Our police force is not educated enough. And then she's dealing with America, but this is an example for the world on dealing with cults like this, wow. I mean, this is psychologically- uh, We're in the Stone Age. We're in the Stone Age when it comes to understanding cults and governments taking cults seriously. Uh, only now in Australia are, are they starting to really take this seriously to the point of saying, we're, we're this close to stripping Jehovah's Witnesses of their charitable status and tax exemptions because of the way they're mismanaging child abuse. That needs to be happening everywhere. Uh, in the UK, there's an investigation that I've been involved with, but they, even though they have the powers to examine the data on child abuse, which is what they did in Australia, they're not taking those powers. They're not looking at the data. Mm. They're not doing the, the full investigation. And, you know, in the United States, you guys are nowhere even close to even doing an investigation of institutional child abuse uh, in, in a religious setting. So unfortunately, we're in the Stone Age when it comes to dealing with cults and the many ways that their influence manifests itself. It's sad. It is sad. Wow. This whole uh, apocalypse thing, before we get off that topic, I think it's important to mention they've had quite a few predictions in history. <laughs> and uh, I don't know about you, but I was taught as a fundamentalist that uh, going to the Old Testament, you know, looking at the Hebrew scriptures, when a prophet says that a time is going to happen and it does not come to pass, he's a false prophet. Deuteron he, Deuteronomy 18.20, I think that was, if I'm not yes. mistaken. So they've predicted quite a few times, if I'm not mistaken. And can you give us a few of those examples? Sure. So, um, and this is one where Jehovah's Witnesses watching will, will be saying, oh, now he's lying. But uh, believe it or not, I have the books <laughs> and I've read them. So all of this is in the books. So Charles Taze Russell, he taught that Armageddon would come by 1914 at the latest. Uh, obviously, that didn't happen. Um, he died um, a couple of years later in 1916 uh, when it was the World War I. So he was at least dying at a point in history where it looked like something might be happening uh, but of course, World War One ended, and that was that. So the next prediction was 1925 by his successor, Joseph Rutherford. 1925 came and went. Um, then a number of decades later, in 1975, uh, they, they predicted, sorry, 1975 uh, for Armageddon. That didn't happen. When I was being raised as a witness, I got baptized in 1990, and the teaching then was that the generation who were old enough to witness and understand the events of 1914 would not die off before Armageddon came. And of course, that <laughs> teaching got put to one side as well. So there's just been incorrect prediction after inc incorrect prediction. I actually do a video about Armageddon predictions because there's lots of dates in between that they've sort of alluded to that also haven't worked out. So Wow. What does that tell you? I mean, come on, you know, like, <laughs> when are we going to stop and just realize it's not going to happen, period? One, one, of, one of the funniest is, is a 1989 Watchtower, uh, where obviously you think of the Watchtower and Awake magazine, you know, they're literal magazines, but they also got printed in what are called bound volumes. So if you were around in 1989 and received this magazine and opened it up, it said, that Armageddon, or it alluded to Armageddon coming before the end of the 20th century in that magazine. 
but they must have realized fairly quickly how silly that was because by the time they did the bound volume it had changed and to this day when you go on the website and you look up that particular paragraph it's the changed version rather than the original but i have the original in, in my collection so that's you're <laughs> awesome man you are awesome <laughs> i'm so glad you do because that's the crap i'm talking about like mm. i mean I, I personally and this is just getting into a little bit of the new testament itself I personally think that's exactly what the New Testament cult was doing, was predicting that it was about to happen, and it didn't. And there were certain events that took place that were written after they actually occurred, ex event two, in the Gospels, like the temple's destruction and whatnot. But that what was supposed to occur... Did, it's like almost like you're you're explaining this gentleman in 1914 the end is happening a war is about to happen i mean they're all looking at the bible look at oh rumors of wars earthquakes famines and they see the same crap that by the way repeats itself endlessly in humanity's mm -hmm. history anyway it's going to happen over and over so we're going to keep on hearing these things well the latest one on my channel is a, a member of the governing body garrett loesch he must have recorded it in the immediate aftermath of the very latest uh, presidential election because he says, haven't we said in the past that there would be close elections? And he, po he points to this 2012 Watchtower article which talks about close elections. And everyone's kind of now scratching their heads thinking, but it, it wasn't a close election. <laughs> it right. was a clear winner. Um, but yeah, that's the sort of vague stuff that, they, oh yeah, close elections, that, that sort of thing is mentioned in the Bible. It isn't mentioned in the Bible. It's just their spin on things. But yeah, it's crazy. Well, one, one more thing. We'll get off that topic. I think this is important. Um, I'm apolitical, right? On this channel, we don't get into politics. We stick to mm. mythology and New Testament. However, I have been watching the top Christian you know, TV preachers in America talk about prophesying. He will be the president. He's the president, blah, blah, blah. Now, here's the deal. This is something I just want to say and then move on. I don't care who you voted for, especially most of my audience are probably going to be from the United States. I don't care. That's fine. I love you no matter what. I want you to know something, though. These Christians that are prophesying these things, they are stating he will win the election. Even if you want to say that there was voter fraud, I don't care what. He is out here being seen as the winner. Like it, it, So unless, <laughs> let me say this, unless somehow Donald Trump ends up being president, like everything that they said is BS. And even if he ends up eventually, because everyone forced somehow these things to take place or whatever happens. I don't know the details. I don't get involved in them too much. They're prophesying that he was going to be the president and he isn't going to be president based on 8 million plus votes that he exceeded Donald Trump on. It's just part of this whole prophetic thing that I'm trying to point out. Like, why didn't he just win to begin with? Why does it have you, to come You must out? understand as well how all of this looks to non-Americans. The, the, the way people are jumping up and down about God <laughs> giving so much of a crap about what happens in one country right. when you have this entire planet with, again, nearly 8 billion people. What about all the other countries? Good point. What, why, is God equally interested <laughs> about all those different elections, or is it just the United States God's interested in? So Our ego sort of is thing. too big. We really <laughs> we kind of deflate so bad. We need to become more worldview instead Next of... Next like, thing you'll have, you'll, you'll invent this religion where someone um, finds plates, uh, golden plates in your country <laughs> and says that the Jews moved over to America and... Dude, you <laughs> the are Garden clever. of Eden was in. <laughs> oh, that is so clever. Oh, that is so... You know, I'm doing a series right now with David Fitzgerald and Bryce Blankenagle from the Naked Mormonism podcast, and he is a wealth of information and knowledge. And holy crap, man, you are 100% right. Lloyd, this is interesting, this, this whole thing. And you are involved in court situations right now on some of these issues. I heard a clip. I don't know if this was from Leah Remini's show. You probably, I'm sure you're all over this, like white on rice, um, where they say the whole, wit you need one or two witnesses. You need two or three witnesses, sorry. At least two to investigate these things. And they literally, in the court cases, said, we're going by our, our religion. Our Bible says this. Um, that How does that mesh with the actual law of the land? You know, it seems like they're going to run into a problem here. The law of the land, unfortunately, is very forgiving of, of all of this because in the United States, you have what's called clergy penitent privilege. 
So most states in the United States are now mandatory reporting states where, like one example is Montana, where uh, Watchtower was recently sued $35 million for covering up abuse. But the judgment got overturned because there is a slight caveat in the mandatory reporting that says, if you are a minister of religion, you get to keep things secret. And that's what they, what Watchtower managed to overturn it on. So unfortunately, yeah, the two witness rule is arguably the most uh, damaging element of the Jehovah's Witness religion when it comes to its whole approach to child abuse. I mean, child abuse simply doesn't happen with an audience. Um, So for, for Jehovah's Witnesses to invoke Deuteronomy 1915, and say, oh, well, we're not going gonna to pretend it didn't happen unless there was, a, you know, two or three witnesses to it. That's just not a practical way of ascertaining whether a child was molested or not. They argue that this is purely their approach to judging the sin of child abuse, and it has no um, impact on whether they report it to the authorities. But when you look at what their track record is when it comes to reporting to the authorities, it's not great. And it suggests that the two witness rule does inform their approach to involving the authorities. In Australia, when they went after the records, they found that out of 1,006 accused pedophiles on Watchtower Australia's database, not a single one had been reported to the authorities. So that's the sort of track record we're dealing with here. Um, Yeah. That's uh, it's sad because they pick and choose what they want as their scripture. Are they adamantly against homosexuality? Yeah. Openly? Okay. And then um, what about polygamy? Oh, no, no polygamy. No, it's not Mormonism. Okay. Right. No, I, I just wondered if they <laughs> yeah. like, if you wanted more than one wife, uh, I mean, Abraham did. I mean, we could talk about biblical characters that did. What well, biblical they- characters had beards, but Jehovah's Witness men aren't allowed to have beards. So they really do have their own spin on things, I'm afraid. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. I just figured I'd throw a few things out there. I asked yeah. Fifth last time if he thought that there, that there was maybe even racism within the, the, uh, within it and he's like and eh, it's kind of hard to say maybe maybe there's some people who are biased mm, arguably not anymore okay. you know to be fair to jehovah's witnesses they are almost conspicuously non-racist at least in terms of the uh, the rank and file followers when you look at the top tier of the organization it is almost exclusively white uh, so there's there's one governing body member out of eight who is a person of color and it's a sim- similarly low um, percentage when you look at the next tier of the hierarchy, which is governing body help. There's very few people of color there. Um, but when it comes to their teachings, I mean, you, you, you look through their magazines and it's showing people of all different races, you know. Right. So you can't really call it, I think, in fairness, a racist religion now. But they do have a dark history in their publications of saying some incredibly racist things. For example, Charles Taze Russell, who's the founder of the movement, you could say, he kept talking about the skin of the Ethiopian, meaning the skin of the black person, turning white in God's new world. So he thought black people were going to turn white, which for some reason was the the divine standard. Um, and How he also, authoritative is someone like that? This is an interesting point to see yeah. in this topic, because in Mormonism, they had prophets. Is this kind of like a prophet to the Jehovah's Witnesses? They don't use the word prophets. They use the word faithful and discreet slave. So they take a verse, Matthew 24, 45, where Jesus describes a parable. He talks, you know, he spoke in parables a lot, or at least in in, in the Gospels, that was the case. Uh, He speaks about a faithful and discreet slave who will feed um, the household the spiritual food at the proper time. And Jehovah's Witnesses say that's more than just a parable. That's a prophecy about the modern day, the end times, when um, a group of true Christians would be selected by Jesus to be this faithful and discreet slave. And they believe that that happened invisibly in 1919. Jesus invisibly selected the faithful slave then. Okay, I didn't mean to cut you off because I know you were still going on about the racism thing, but it came to my mind trying to equate it to something. That, but when they speak, it's authoritative. Like they can, they almost look. Oh, at you like can't question it. 
Yeah. There's no such thing as an in, an in or out Jehovah's Witness. So if you're a Jehovah's Witness, you have the, you have to believe every word of it. Uh, and if you have any doubts, you have to keep completely quiet about them. If you if you say anything publicly that contradicts the the religion, then you'll be classed as an apostate. What do you hope to see happen here? I mean, of course, I know we'd love for something like this organization to go away. Um, but what do you hope to accomplish in all of this? The, the good news is that my expectations are quite low. Um, all I hope to accomplish is for there to be resources available that will help people to wake up and make it increasingly hard for people to stay indoctrinated. And that's already happening. So there's, there's not just my YouTube channel. There are many YouTube channels now. There's a wonderful uh, XJW Reddit community. There's uh, documentaries coming out. You mentioned the Aftermath special. That was a big deal in the XJW uh, community. There's, there's been other documentaries as well. In fact, just in the last week or so, there's been one in Norway that came out. Um, so there's slowly but surely more and more exposure Governments are starting to take more of an interest, so we're excited about what's happening in Australia. But really, my 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 whole thing is to just put the information out there so that witnesses can have both sides of the argument. And if I've done that, then I've done my job. And uh, so I take great pleasure in receiving emails and messages and voicemails from people who say, look, this has made a difference. In fact, my wife was reading an email to me this morning uh, from a family in Denmark, where as recently as this year, they were Jehovah's Witnesses, but they started watching my rebuttals to the 2020 Always Rejoice convention, and it woke them up. And wow. uh, and it's it's resulted in the whole family, including the children, getting out. And I take special delight in children making it out, because they will never, it will never be even a thing for them. You know, right. if you can get out as a child then you're not even going to be bothered about it by the time you're my age. So I'm, I'm really thrilled about that. Wow, man. Thank you for doing what you do. Honestly, like that's, I'm so glad to meet a like-minded person who's not a hater or antagonizer, so to speak. I think that a lot of the beliefs are silly. Yeah. And people watch my channel know that they know that I think that it's superstitious uh, that it's, you know, a lot of it comes from a cult. They might have, I guess you say, um, diluted it from being so intense like it probably was within the new testament because it if you really wanted to be exactly what you find in the new testament you're going to be you're not going to fit in society you're exactly going to be like this you're going to be running around looking for gay people to kill if, if, you, if you live your life according <laughs> to the old testament yeah i'm talking so about it new has testament, to be either way it has to be watered down doesn't it the bible yeah. to some degree yeah I was telling that to my sister-in-law who's actually a Christian. And I was like, no matter what, you've got to pick and choose. Cause if not, you won't, you just won't work. It won't fit. Uh, Amish people for, for example, you know, they pick and choose too. But uh, anyway, um, I think this is well worth noting. I feel that it would be my hope and goal is to at least change the organization itself even, because if it's not going to go anywhere, of course we want to help people leave it. But uh, if it's not going to go anywhere, we need to change the structure so more of this stuff doesn't happen. It's kind of like what Leah Remini's talking about on Scientology with all these sex abuse scandals and stuff that are going on where they can't go to outside authorities. There needs to be a way where they can have more freedom and there needs to be – they need to – I guess if it's the truth, you don't need to force people – psychologically to hold on to it they should be like yo i'm going to follow what is accurate and what is true but but obviously that's not the case but it so. suits the leaders to keep everyone in the dark they don't want people to see both sides so even though i look i've met i made a video a, a few years back saying 20 things jehovah's witnesses need to do in order to reform here's 20 reforms that will make jehovah's witnesses a mostly benign mostly harmless group it won't fix everything but you know, this is a long. This will get us a long way to it being a you know a, a normal you know quote unquote religion. Um, 
I made that video just for the sake of argument. I don't honestly believe they will ever reform. Right. Uh, if anything, they're getting more and more extreme as time passes, which again is why my expectations are so low. I don't expect the organization to change. I expect them to get more and more extreme, almost like uh, the more they enter their death throes, that they're acting like a caged tiger. You know, The more the internet erodes their authority, the more they, they fight back. Um, that's kind of the the spirit we're, we're seeing from them. But again, I'm not really interested in that anymore. I'm more interested in waking people up because then you get to bypass the whole issue. Um, you get to see people being free and being able to think for themselves. Wow, man. I know that's what you live for now. It's it's exciting. I get people who email me talking about what this channel's done. And I know there's just this motivation to keep going. And I hope you do keep going. Um, I want to ask you something about the leadership. Um, I saw a gentleman who spoke like this on the video camera. Stephen Lett. What yeah. is up with that? That uh, is that just yeah. what's going on there, man? That's yeah. yeah. He well, he is probably one of the two most interesting governing body members to watch. The other one being Anthony Morris, who was. Uh, interestingly found in a booze store uh, last year filmed buying very expensive whiskey which kind of connected the dots in terms of his slurring speech when he gives talks but yeah Stephen Letts the other one who's really interesting to watch and he does have this very melodramatic um, way of speaking we, we tend to call him rubber face uh, among the ex-Jehovah's Witness community because he has a very a very odd face um, he didn't always speak that way. You can find older videos from, say, 10, 20 years ago where he was speaking quite normally. It seems to be something where he's developed this kind of stage persona almost. Because I even have a video, a, a fairly recent video of him speaking to Bethelites, not, not expecting outsiders to be watching the video, and he just dialed it down a little bit. So, yeah, it's, and, and I've spoken to his relatives as well, and they've confirmed it, um, that, yeah, this is a persona that he seems to have developed in recent years. But, yeah, if you watch him now, it's right up there with kind of Ken Copeland levels of creepiness. The, yes. it's, it's just not sincere at all, is it? It's very no, fake. that's why. And it, but it was so entertaining. It was yeah. like, and he wants you. He warmly I'll welcome you, brothers and sisters. That's how he begins his videos. Yeah. Wow, man. And you know, I want to say this for anyone who's watched this far. If you are Jehovah's Witness or left, um, we know that Jehovah's Witnesses are good people. We know they mean well. We know they only know what they know. And that's why you do what you do, because they're not a bunch of people who are just haters. Of course, they might not like you. They might hate you because their system makes them see things this way. You're an enemy. So they don't like you. They're not going to love you like, you know, unconditionally, of course. Um, but you're doing that. You're I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. You're more like Christ than they are right now. And I know they don't like that. OK, they probably won't like that saying, but I'm just being honest because I started off being the number one XJW, which I don't agree with, by the way. And now I'm Jesus Christ. You, you're you're feeling my head's going to be so big by the end of this interview. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to be able to get out talking like this, <laughs> and you're going to let me know. <laughs> oh man, Lloyd, what do we do, man? What do we do? Okay, we got to keep telling people who are ex Jehovah's Witnesses who are not afraid to say something, create a YouTube channel, create videos. If not, at least come on these shows, contact um, some of these guys. You can contact me, contact Lloyd, contact other channels, put your story out there. The more information we can get out there, the better. Definitely get Lloyd's book. That's a must get. If you're an ex Jehovah's Witness or you're a Jehovah's Witness and you're considering looking into this and wanting to know in depth, The Reluctant Apostate. Definitely get it. And look at that mug. Skewing my face there. So you're there glowing, bro. You're you're not you're an angel. That's 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 <laughs> three compliments. We'll talk about the prices after the show. Okay. Um, yeah. But don't tell anyone. <laughs> if you could just give me an invoice, the the the, the price is going up and up and up. No worries. Uh, <laughs> I, it's flattering, you know. Um, but no, I mean, I mean, seriously, any Jehovah's Witnesses watching this will hopefully um understand or if they don't understand let me tell you um again it's not coming from a place of hatred um i live with two jehovah's witnesses as i mentioned before i have two jehovah's witnesses living in this building i care very deeply about jehovah's witnesses because they are mostly very kind very loving people um i just don't think they deserve to be lied to and exploited 
So that's why I make these videos so that when they are in the position to start questioning their beliefs, if they ever get to that position, the information's there for them. I don't go chasing Jehovah's Witnesses around, shoving videos in their faces. It's entirely down to them. If they want to spend the rest of their lives as Jehovah's Witnesses and that works for them, fine. I don't lose a wink of sleep. All I want to do is make sure the other side of the argument is available to them if they ever decide to go down that route. And they can choose it one way or the other give them exactly. free choice here yeah i think they deserve that much and anyone watching you deserve that much and i'm sure most people who see this are probably sitting on the fence or have already left whatever organization they were part of lloyd last question i have and um you, you've touched on some really good stuff and i didn't cry on this one man i teared up on fifths and uh oh you but, haven't heard my last answer yet Ooh, i might the interview is still young that's true. That's true. Well, I got. I figure we do more of these. If you ever have the time, obviously, sure. I want. I want to get you on my platform more. I want more people to become aware mm. of you, and we can come up with topic-related uh, suggestions mm. that I think are important from the comment section. You guys can play a part of that, and I'll send the questions to Lloyd. Lloyd can look them over and go. Sure, we'll do an episode um, discussing these particular things. But I ask that you guys show Lloyd that uh, it's worth coming on this channel by getting the book, checking out his material. Go check it out. Uh, that helps him keep doing this. I can't tell you if you're gonna if you're gonna pay something, don't pay ten percent in tithe. Buy a book, you know, and this would be one of them. So for sure. Um, last question, Leah Remini, are you dating her now? Or <laughs> <laughs> I think kidding. her husband would have something to say oh, if I were dating her. That's true. Uh, no, she. Saying. She's she's a wonderful human being. Actually, um, obviously, she is the only ho friend I have who is also a Hollywood star. And uh, when I first met her, you do have all sorts of preconceptions about what Hollywood Hollywood stars are like. Uh, but she was incredibly down to earth. And one thing that really impressed me, because you, you always think in the back of your mind, is this just for ratings? You know, right. are, you, are you just pretending to care? Because it looks good on camera. No, she is a firebrand activist. I I went for breakfast, uh, was it a year or so ago? I think last year, pre-COVID, obviously. And she invited me to her house to have breakfast. And, and I said, you know, Leah, um, are, you, are you done with this? Are you, are you ready to walk away? And she was like, no, I'm carrying on. Um, and that's why she's doing the Fair Game podcast now. Uh, so no one's going to shut her up. Uh, she really, really cares about these issues. And I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled that her and Mike saw fit to include Jehovah's Witnesses in the whole thing because there are commonalities and it is bigger than just one movement. Absolutely, man. I actually emailed Mike and uh, mm. fingers crossed. He, he, I know he's busy, man, but uh, I want to get him on because he knows in-depth things about Scientology that we've heard snippets on the show but mm. the, you can't go to the depths there's so much on that mm. as well as i suspect jehovah's witnesses have a similar theme so ladies and gentlemen if you've been watching this long comment down below and tell us what you're interested in hearing make sure you go subscribe to his channel you are supporting freedom of thought that's the absolute fact Go and support by subscribing, liking his stuff. Leave a comment for the algorithm. Um, buy a book. Anything that you know you can do to help Lloyd continue this. He's a huge voice in the ex Jehovah's Witness field, and, and quite possibly Jesus Christ. You might have an afterlife. You heard it right here, here first. <laughs> Okay, I didn't mean it like that. I meant that you, <laughs> you, see, now you're doing what Jehovah's Witnesses do with my words. You see, spinning it around, you're twisting spinning, it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just saying you're more Christ like <laughs> by unconditionally okay. loving okay. them, regardless. Thank of you for what, clarifying. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. Sir, no problem. <laughs> In case I get blasphemy, goodness, like, uh, what is that? The life of Brian when they said. Uh, he's always... not the Messiah, he's a very naughty boy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Well, um, Thank you so much for coming on, brother. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Let's do this again. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't, I hope you do remember, we are Myth Vision. <laughs>